Hi, uh, my name is Doug Ferguson, and I'm going to be talking about uh, Civil War, uh, the Westminster Confession, and why um, we really should know about history and how we can make our nation better in the current day. We have a lot of problems uh, anyway. And uh, an understanding of history can give us some enlightenment. Okay, so here we go. A nation, this is one thing that's really important to understand. A nation is a people gathered in common perspective of reality to form institutions of governance, law, commerce and charity. Now, um, people <laughs> in government, they don't even understand this. Um, because common perspective, this is very important to know, common perspective reality. Some people, um, well, they, they kind of do, they want to have everybody thinking the same way. Um, uh, in the nation um, and that's what they try to do with the narrative so uh, if you have but the problem is is that the only thing they want people to think like let's say in Canada or in China is that the government whatever its narrative is is the truth so basically it's the divinity of government and uh, that's the only thing that they have for the common perspective. It's not, um, it's, it, it, government is all authority. That is the common perspective. And the problem is, is that um, they think that government, uh, well, they, they, they do this, they, they change the, their, their, uh, dictates all the time they, 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 they counter their own commands they counter their own things they they uh, they say don't steal and then they steal they they say don't do this you know don't <laughs> don't drive your car and then they drive their cars they you know so so they uh, you know don't fly then they fly don't use power don't you know like eat bugs but you know they're gonna eat, not gonna eat bugs I mean they're gonna um, it's not a, it's a con the only common perspective is is that they can lord it over you that's the common perspective the divinity of government okay and this is a big thing across the world uh, people think that once they're in power they have uh, divine authority and yet they don't have to be consistent to their authority uh, they, they don't have to do what they say. You do what they say, but they don't have to do what they say. So they are, this is a, it's an understanding actually of, uh, of uh, a lot of times of the God that they, they believe in, a God of a tyrant. You know, it doesn't matter what the God says because he is divine and therefore uh, their God is basically not true to itself. It's just true to power. It's just power. That's the only thing they have. That's the that's their God. It's not a God that is true to itself. It's inconsistent to itself. It'll say one thing and do another. And that's the only perspective that they have, a common perspective of reality, um, which is an inconsistent reality, which isn't the truth. It's a common perspective of lying, basically. Uh, but if you can form a nation like that, I suppose, well, it just destroys itself, actually. But uh, anyway, I'll get, <laughs> I'll get into that anyway later. That's just a, I just kind of got on a rant there. Sorry. Uh, okay, a nation is a people gathered in common perspective reality to form institutions of governance, law, and charity. Okay, back in, uh, when, when people in, in a nation have a divergent perspectives of reality, conflict occurs or if they have a 
if their common perspective is just lying and stealing, then there would be conflict also. On the Isle of England, uh, I should check that out, if it was called England, you know, Brit Britain, in 1643, the people were divided in understanding of how to relate to one another. And this divergence culminated into a civil war beginning in 1643. Um, this uh, um, conflict was actually going on for centuries. Uh, two different cultures. Uh, the, the Norman culture, which is basically a French culture, and uh, which has idea that uh, authority is divine, okay, which is what I was just talking about. And then you have uh, um, the uh, Viking Christian culture, which was uh, Vikings took over a lot of uh, Britain and on the outskirts, and they were basically turned. They, they settled and and uh, had uh, communities along the mostly along the um, edges of uh, you know on the ocean uh, communities. Uh, and they had the thing where you had merit, and but they became Christians, so that they believed in, you know, being, um, you know, uh, you know, don't steal, don't like Viking culture before that was it, it glorified in stealing and cheating, and and duping another person, uh, but when it became Christian, it didn't have those kind of things. Yet it still had the idea that you. Uh, had to have some kind of, um, you know, merit to rule. You had to, you know, you had to be shown, you, you had to be given the abilities to rule. It was more of that idea. And uh, the idea that people had the freedom to choose things and to, to do, whereas the Norman culture was uh, more of a, a God's already chosen what you are, where you're supposed to be in your position and all that. <coughs> Uh, very authoritarian uh, thing. So you had this culture. Now there was variations of this. You always get, you know, uh, variations of some people, you know, believe in a bit of each and so forth. But the basic dichotomy was that one was merit and getting the gifts to rule. The other was I rule because I've just been divined authority by the church or whatever. So you had this conflict. And, and it... Um, <coughs> it culminated in 1643 when they started uh, they had uh, a civil war and they uh, anyway um, you know find out later that uh, when they're trying to solve the problem they they were thinking that this would you know they didn't really know how to solve the problem anyway Clarity in understanding conflict is rare during any time of history because people in society cannot differentiate the general from the specific or lies from truth. They think the specifics are major issues. Okay, this is true. It's true in our time. Um, uh, and in fact, a lot of times they use uh, in the narrative they use the minor issues to keep people from understanding the major issues. And, or they might, you know, it, it, you're always being hit by side arguments, uh, things that hit you from the side, but they, they don't really tell you what's really going on. They make issues about things that, uh, and get people, they, basically it's called gaslighting. They gaslight people so they can, can uh, manipulate and, and take people unaware and it happens all the time and you always have to be aware that you could be gaslighted that way you will less likely be gaslighted okay the major dichotomy in culture in england has been occurring in europe for several centuries and it's still occurring okay and that's basically what i was talking about the idea of divine authority or uh, given uh, the gifts and then doing what you can do or knowing, like, uh, one is, you know, a person just thinks they know, and they tell you what to do, yet they've never done it before, or whatever. Another is uh, people doing it from, uh, 
learning and 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 finding out things and and earning their merit. Okay. Anyway, conflict, a perspective between lording over or serving others, knowing truth or searching for truth. Okay, these are the conflict, okay? Uh, pride or humbleness. This is what I'm talking about. Divine authority of the enlightened or divine authority of rule of law. Okay, so you have divine authority of, enlightenment, of the enlightened or divine authority rule of law. And you know, a lot of people use the word rule of law, yet they think the rule of law means divine authority from office. And so the, the laws don't apply to them, uh, but uh, whatever they state from their office is divine. And the problem is, is that uh, they, uh, they, when they do that, they actually break down the, um, the authoritative structures of society because people realize that, uh, you know, I can't listen to this person because they're inconsistent. And so all the people that are following the orders of the office learn they, they it's in, it comes into their idea that that uh, even themselves they can be above their office and they can make their own decisions um, and be arbitrary in their judgment. So it it just kind of the whole when when a when the highest office is acting in that manner, it just breaks down the whole society, the whole uh, authoritative structure, and pretty soon you have lots of little gangs going around instead of one big gang, which isn't good either. In China, they have one big gang, but then it breaks down, and then everybody, then they have big fight and uh, do a purge. And that's what happens in, when you have this divine authority of the enlightened. You basically encourage, you basically encourage gangsterism and purges after gang gang wars, okay, in government. It's called politics, I guess it's called. <laughs> because of those living at the time lacked clarity on the issues dividing the nation, their efforts to bring peace uh, by writing a document confessing their understanding of reality increased the conflict. Okay. Now, uh, in 1643, they tried to bring peace, okay, by writing a document uh, after the Civil War started, okay. And I'll get into that. That's we're talking about the Westminster Confession. That was the real reason they wrote it up. The scholars thought the trees they nurtured in their minds as the forest, okay. What I'm saying is they made uh, the minor points major points. That's what I'm saying there, okay. And uh, that was a problem. And also they had some, and they didn't understand the conflict. So they didn't really address the conflict itself. They didn't understand it. They didn't know, even though they were scholars. Okay. In 1646, religious scholars drew up the Westminster Confession, which was their attempt to gather the people into a common understanding of reality. And then that, that would help bring peace to the, to the situation, they thought. In doing this, they hope to bring peace between the people by giving a standardized understanding of Christianity. or And this was their way of standardizing their understanding of reality. Okay, You have a religion and it standardizes reality. Okay, And, and you may be saying, oh, well, look at how religion starts with... It's... <laughs> it's a, yeah, well, if you don't have religion you're going to start a war even faster, let me tell you. If you don't have any standards, you're going to start a war much faster. If you have no idea, even understanding of your goal, you're going to start a war even faster. And this is what um, communism does. It doesn't have any standards of, of uh, you know, reality. It, it has no real goal. It's called a utopia, which they don't know what it is, really. And they figure that if they just destroy the current system, They'll rebuild it somehow because the universe just rebuilds things better, right? Progressive, like it's 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 the idea of evolution, where somehow the uh, catatonic universe is going to build something better out of destruction because the people that are destroying don't have any clue of what they're going to build after.
they just they just think that they're going to build something because it's going to be in their image, and it's going to be winter bar. But it's, it's all about death and destruction. Anyway, I'll continue on. <laughs> uh, the document that uh, the religious scholars drew up, the Westminster Confession, uh, though 151 pages long with additional catechisms to address issues, appears to be ponderous, uh, but most of the document made up of references to scripture, so it's not as long as it looks, uh, though, I, though uh, it's way too long. No, compared to other documents stating a concise summary of Christian confession, it would be considered extremely long, and uh, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed being two examples of that. They, and I'm going to talk about why um, a short, concise belief system is much, much, much better than having a long belief system. Okay. Because of its length and its assertions, uh, the Westminster Confession, instead of being a unifying document for Christians to gather in one spirit to form one nation under God, became a divisive document between Christians. Instead of edifying the body, encouraging further learning of scripture, or in scripture, the philosophies of science, mathematics, culture, and law, to create solid institutions, <coughs> justice, commerce, and charity, it hardened minds in prideful thoughts and judgments of others. <coughs> because of, you know, because people have variant knowledge of reality. People have a doesn't matter um, if you try to do this. People have variant understandings of reality. What you want to do, and I'll be getting into this, is you want to simplify it so that each person can make a decision of whether they're actually following the simplified uh, understanding. And they can and it and it will help clarify in their mind where they're going okay so you make it so that everyone can just simply look at what they're looking at and make a decision are they going the right way or are they going the wrong way but if you make it a huge complicated thing they get lost in the babble gab so then it doesn't help it doesn't help you have to make it short and i'll get into why that basically what i just said it just makes it so much easier to understand yourself when it's nice and short. When it's short, you can understand yourself. And if every person in the nation can understand themselves better, they all can focus on the goal much better. And that's how you do it. Yeah. Some say the reason for the length is the many heresies at the time that needed to be corrected. Okay, now that's a big thing that's uh, people worrying about the heresies. Uh, this is a poor argument. Uh, actually, concise statements on belief focus issues, making it easier, easier to address heresy. Christ's words emphasize this in bringing beliefs into his kingdom. Uh, if you just take John 3, 16, 17, and 18, they state the fundamentals of Christianity making statements of heresy easy to argue against, if you actually look at that. Okay. Now, if you made it much longer than that, it would start getting too complicated and it would be hard to... And then Paul would write, too. All I want you to know is, you know, Christ lived, he died on the cross for our sins, and he was risen again so that we can talk to him because now we believe that our sins were forgiven at the cross and he has taken us into his... Uh, confidence and he, we can actually talk to him and he'll put a new heart in us so that we'll be uh, you know doing what God wants us to do living in a life of love and, and for him and love for other people and uh, God will give us the ability to do that you know uh, and then he's going to change the whole world make it new at the resurrection and we'll have uh, a life with him, know him. Okay, so it's it's even shorter than that. It's, uh, he says a, a short summary. Basically, I want you to know that Christ died. He uh, rose again and ascended it to God. And you know, 
according to the scriptures and so it's even got the scriptures in in that thing so so um it's very concise and with that conciseness you can find heresies very quick okay when studying history during the time when the Nicaeans and the apostles creed Nicene creed apostle creed was were created the number and divisions of heresies present at that time far exceeded the heresies in the 17th century in in the local of locale of Britain uh, so um, so I probably should have spelt that with an E on the local anyway locale of Britain so um, you know yeah, I mean the heresies were there in the 17th century but the amount of heresies back in the first and second century and third century were so many more like there are so many heresies you wouldn't believe it it's like it's like Babylon anyway many of these those heresies during the first century after Christ's death in the Middle East are not uncom not commonly known now because these creeds were the creeds themselves, Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, were used to snuff out, snuff them out, and to not be proclaimed. Though one can still find them in historical writings, or some of them anyway. Some of them are just completely gone. So, uh, these short creeds destroyed all a lot, thousands of heresies. I'm talking thousands of heresies. Okay. <laughs> some of them based on the same ideas but thousands of them okay. uh, elegant short statements do not mean that they are simple okay a short a short statement of a belief system or an understanding of things does not mean it's simple though they appear so take for example Einstein's equation it appears simple yet understanding this equation brings knowledge of time matter and energy generating light from the stars and the working of atoms so just consider that and if you actually use like let's say Einstein's equation you can do a lot of stuff with it it's very simple it's but it's easy to get down to the what's really going on to quite a degree in the universe and it's the same for many, many, many other um, ideas. Like if you simplify it, just get it simple and concise. It's so much better. I wish I could get this thing simpler and concise, but anyway. So instead of effectively dealing with heresy, size hides heresies. You don't want big, ponderous documents like like they do for the taxation and and uh, government regulations you want something very simple and then you can deal with things when it gets ponderous you can hide lying and sealing and all that kind of stuff and the old creeds themselves can be used to cleanse the Westminster Confession from heresies within the document Yeah, okay, no, this, this, you know, it's the many Protestants, since they base their whole religion on the Westminster uh, Confession, uh, would consider that a real problem, just what I just said, that there's heresies in the Westminster Confession, and uh, there is heresies in it. I realize that this statement is controversial to Presbyterians who may consider questioning the Confession, the Westminster Confession, with its many proof texts, to question it. Can they might consider that blasphemous, but the assertions in the Westminster Confession are not holy script, not even close. I mean, they use holy script, but the assertions and everything in it are not are not uh, holy script. Okay, and the, well, it's a translation anyway, but uh, it's still it's holy script, and uh, even though they use it, they misuse it. Okay. <laughs> see, I'm, they're going to be mad at me for saying that, and I'll be a heretic for saying that, but that's true. 
The writers of the Westminster Commission, uh, Confession make many assertions backed up with scripture. But some assertions made must be forced into understanding of the scripture. Other times the scripture they use has little to do with the message uh, a little to do with the message in those scriptures. So, uh, so the assertions they they use has little to do with the message in those scriptures. Okay. Therefore, the poor exegesis done in this confession encourages and attempts to legitimize foreign ideas into scripture. Okay. Now, the Presbyterians won't like me saying that, but that's this is true, and. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, okay. I think you know, like a lot of Calvinism is uh, very much uh, a foreign idea into Scripture, and uh, you really have to not really read it, but push your ideas into it in order to get Calvinism out of it. It has also it also shows the lack of imagination and understanding of trying to understand God uh, lack of questioning you know anyway but anyway and lack of real searching for God it also uses the word infallible truth but does not define the term in its scope the writers of scriptures themselves do not consider the scripture in terms of infallible even the practice of using scripture in the proof text manner abuses the study of scripture. Proof texting scripture is being a hacker, not a scholar. And what I mean is, it's more like cutting and pasting, and not really trying to understand scripture. And it's forcing, forcing scripture to be what uh, you want it to be. Quoting scripture does not mean scripture is being used for its intended purpose. And we all know that, uh, and I won't use the stupid thing to say that they're Satan or anything, but Satan does that, you know. Okay. In point one seven, it addresses understanding the scripture. Now, this is in the Westminster Confession, chapter one, point seven. That scripture is plain enough to, in, for everyone, for everyone can uh, to understand it. I should have rewritten this. It's plain enough for everyone to understand and consider true. Yet people like Luther took years to conclude that salvation is only based in belief in the works of Christ and not in any man. Now, yeah, yeah, okay. So even understanding what this means, there's lots of debate about that. Uh, some people think, uh, anyway, it's, but, if you take scriptures for just what it is, it's easy to understand. It's when you try to force things, um, it, it confuses things, which many people do. So though scripture is excellent literature, that does not mean that the listener or reader will understand what is written, whether educated or ignorant. Okay. So Luther, he, he actually even uh, you know, translated the Bible, or kind of translated the Bible, or made it, there's a Lutheran Bible, uh, but it, you know, it's really actually a work, not just of Luther, uh, and he had a lot of help, um, you know, and he didn't, uh, you know, he had different texts, he, he, he anyway, he did uh, a lot of, he did some translation, but anyway, there's a Lutheran Bible. Even when he did the Bible, and when you're doing that, even if you're working with other people, you're really actually going into the Scripture. And when you're, uh, um, um, and he and he preached the Scripture, and he taught a lot of the Scripture, and he still didn't know uh, you're justified by the works of Christ rather than the works of man. That's because. The Catholic religion at the time believed that the works of man justified you. I say, you know, Christ and the works of man. So, it, um, and they didn't understand about putting his iniquity upon Christ and actually getting forgiveness from Christ at the time. So, so, um, 
I'm just, what I'm saying is you can read and read and read and you can still be ignorant or not know what's going on in scripture. So though it is plain, that doesn't mean that people can understand it because they always throw in their own prejudice and their biases in there and it makes it hard for them to understand. If they just take the words for what they mean, it makes it a lot easier, but they don't. Nobody does that. So you have to be very careful that you actually read the words, not the, what you think the words say. You actually have to read the words. <laughs> you know, this sounds kind of weird, but that's true. <laughs> In the Westminster Confession, uh, chapter uh, 1 and verse 10 or point 10, concludes that the supreme judge in all controversies can rest in nothing but the Holy Spirit speaking in scriptures, which begs the question, okay, what happens when you get two people reading the scripture and they both say that they have the Holy Spirit behind them and they disagree totally, okay? <laughs> when each script, side of scripture you, you support their argument in controversies, okay? Each side is... Uh, each side representing the, is each side representing the Holy Spirit, even though they're totally opposed to each other. Uh, okay, each side can say that their side is representing the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the statement uh, does not really solve any controversies. Uh, saying that uh, the Holy Spirit is the supreme judge. Okay, yeah. Well, who, who says the, I got the divine message, and then the other person says I got the divine message? Well, then what do you do, right? One controversy Christians have is the lawful process of salvation determine if one is saved and how a person who is saved is to live dealing with themselves, others, and the world. Okay, That's a big controversy. The lawful process. Understanding of that. What does scripture say about determining who is a Christian? This is very important because what happens is that when two people disagree on important issues of Christianity, the other says that they're not a Christian anymore. Okay. Now, this is very important because they have to understand what makes them a Christian. If they don't know what a Christian makes them a Christian, if they think that you're a Christian if you agree with me, but if you don't agree with me, you're not a Christian, then, you know, you, you can... You can... Uh, you know, you maybe you don't, the person who's stating that, maybe they don't know what being a Christian is. They, maybe they just don't they really have an understanding of what a Christian is when they're making those kind of statements. So, uh, when they say, if you don't agree with me, you're not a Christian, my way. And actually, a simple thing to determine if a person's a Christian is John 3, 16, 17, and 18. If, they're, if they confess those things, um, they're they're probably, I would say they're Christian, you know. <clears throat> In fact, you, I would say they're, they're Christian, no matter if they agree with me or not. These verses in the South say enough on the matter to determine who is saved and who is not. Okay. Yet these scriptures do not tell the legal requirements or the acts of the believer needed for salvation, except for their confession. Okay. And, uh, and that is a more thorough understanding of Scripture, actually, only magnifies the truth of the power of the believer's confession as all that is needed for salvation through Christ's work. <clears throat> Therefore, the confession of the believer, as stated in John 3.16, is all that is needed. If you actually understood what the confession means, and you actually went into it more into detail and understood it, I think people that realize, that don't realize that the confession is so, so, so important, like it is everything, is because they don't really understand what it means. They think they, they, they know it, but they don't. Okay? They really don't. And if you use 151 pages, 151 pages are not only unnecessary, but distorts, uh, distracts, and limits the power of the Holy Spirit and the knowledge that can be gained by studying Scripture. 
So <clears throat> that's definitely, uh, when you read the Westminster Confession, you find that it is very stifling and not something that encourages study of the Holy Sp of the Scripture. It's more of an indoctrination. Okay, it's not actually a learning process. Okay, and the nature of God, man, Scripture, and salvation has all been debated through the centuries. Okay, are we to consider those who do not agree with one's personal or group understanding as a heretic? Though they confess their belief in Christ for salvation and their belief that the Bible is God's revelation of himself to mankind. Okay. Uh, what I'm just saying is, <clears throat> should, why should one be so presumptuous as that to... Um, Is the Westminster Confession divine? Surely the Westminster Confession is not the determining factor for for, for determining. <laughs> I gotta redo really this. It's not the determining factor for finding if one is a Christian, for it did not exist until the sixteen hundreds. And it's locale I should have put it E there, locale uh, is Britain. Okay. Or are we to consider all those who declare themselves followers of Christ who know nothing of this Western Mr. Westminster Confession, not as Christians? Okay, so if if we consider that those who do not know this confession and do not necessarily agree with this confession, uh then uh, are they like people like Peter, Paul, and John, and many others? Were they not saved or followers of Christ? Okay, and I think that they would have a problem with Westminster Confession. All those three, personally, and are we going to consider those people not Christians? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, yeah. Okay, I know the I know the Presbyterians will go nuts on that. Yeah, they really they to me they they're just so uh, stagnant and hardened in the brain that they just don't even anyway. Can the clear understanding of Scripture prevail over biases of the reader? That's yeah. Uh, everyone must be aware that they are easily blinded by their assumptions. One needs to be aware that when understanding script that of Scripture is controversial, one needs to be aware that when an understanding of Scripture is controversial, reflection on what is written needs to be done. Okay, maybe a comma would be nice right there. Okay. So, and uh, one should not be quick to judge the other as wrong. Possibly all may be wrong in understanding of the scripture given the problem. Okay. Uh, there's lots of places where it's like that. Because uh, we just don't know what happened there. Maybe we're not even understanding what the writer was writing. There's places there. It's, a, it's an ancient document. They had a Hebrew was fairly limited in its uh, vocabulary, written vocabulary. You and you may come across things that happen that are very hard to explain, and so um, they may not. Everything's not always easy to understand, and making assumptions about things is not always the best thing to do. You know, it's, it's time to, you, you can say, hey, I don't really understand, but it could be this. You know, <laughs> you know, I wasn't really there, but it could be this, or it could be that, or it could be this, it could be that. There's lots of places where it could be a lot of things. And to say that you know 
is being very presumptuous. We should not be quick to condemn others who uh, think we have divine knowledge. Remember, everybody has a, a ability to read the scriptures. And just because your opinion or your bias is what it is, doesn't mean you have divine knowledge. Remember, love for others is the highest goal rather than winning an argument, or if not winning, burning the other at the stake. Okay, so, um, and you know, what love, you know what love means. It means commitment and it means thankfulness. That's what the Ten Commandments is about. A commitment to God is the first four, and being thankful for what God's giving you is the last six. Okay, so, uh, you know, if, you, if you're thankful for what God's giving you, you won't covet anybody else's stuff. You won't lie and you won't steal. That's what all that's about, not being thankful. It's a regenerate heart that you have, then you're thankful. And and a love for God, for what he's, who he is, right? So it's commitment, love is about commitment and thankfulness. Sacred commitment and sacred thankfulness. And that's your highest goal. Really, that is the highest goal. That's what the law is about. Anyway. Remember, it took years for Luther to understand justification by faith in the works of Christ rather than the works of men. In truth, his distillation of the teaching of justification did not fully synthesize in his mind until after he had written a translation of the Bible into German. And this was after years of persecution of Luther by the Catholic Church, whom he was a member of and had been uh, and this persecution had been done earnestly for several years against him. Okay. So, um, what I'm saying is, don't be quick to judge your brother. Try to understand and realize that when you are angry at your brother, you're actually close to, at the gates of hell, okay, to be angry at your brother. To call him a fool is you're close to the gates of hell. So realize that you really have to consider what you're thinking and your attitude towards your brother. By what standard of infallibility should the word be understood? <clears throat> this word is never used in the Bible to describe itself. It is word to subject dominion over others, as far as I can tell, to take some blow heart knows scripture and that other has ha, that and that no other has the right to question. Okay. I find the word blasphemous actually. Uh, if, to use the word infallibility, I find that word blasphemous against God and Scripture. Lacking any understanding of extra Jesus, limiting the the truth, the search for truth. From scripture and the wisdom of the spirit okay so <laughs> uh, I and I understand I'm like, this is the way I see it okay and I understand that tons of people use that I think for me uh, for understanding scripture it's infallible whichever that means it, it, like they just it can be that word can be contorted uh, crazy like you can use the word infallible to say poetic scripture in psalms or something is science and since science doesn't go with that it's better like it it's just it's it's just a stupid term okay it's it's a term out of ignorance i think really <laughs> I realize that most will consider me apostate right off the bat before even attempt to understand what I'm saying about this. I am not saying I do not believe that the flood happened or that God did not create the universe, nor that Moses did not lead the people out of Egypt around 1450 BC or many other things in the Bible. And this is what happens when, uh, you know, I was reading some, you know, Google, oh, you don't believe the word of God is infallible. Well, you must believe this and this and this. No, I don't believe this and this and this. I just believe that the term infallible is stupid. <laughs> what I'm stating is people who read the Bible think they understand it, yet they are only working from their own biases and inflated opinions of themselves. 
Yes. <laughs> they are too full of themselves to search for truth that is written in the intent of the authors. This is the purpose of using the word infallibility for describing scripture. That's what I see. Okay. I'm not saying that the scripture is not God's word and it has amazing, amazing uh, uh, things to share and, and all sorts of stuff in it. I'm just saying that infallibility is just a stupid word to use. Because <laughs> it's just so stupid. It's just one person, they can say something stupid and say, if you don't believe that, well, then you don't believe in the Bible. <laughs> if you don't believe the way I think, then you don't believe in the Bible. It's all stupid. You may not even realize that you're doing this, thinking the word is infallible. So tell somebody questions your understanding, and then they get on their high horse. No. I'm under you, I know more than you, blah, blah, blah. Or, you don't believe in God. Like, you don't believe in the Bible. Oh, boy. Anyway, sometimes when questions come from the yin-yang, Sometimes when question, the questions come, the yin-yang think such things about scripture starts to contort words. Okay, and this is not very well written there. I should have fixed it up. I was going to fix it up, but then I forgot about it. Okay. What I mean here is that sometimes when a uh, person gets questioned, and I call him the person getting questioned is the yin-yang, uh, they start to... Uh, you actually contort the meanings of the words in scripture uh, to understandings that were never conceived by the writers and they make up elaborate contorted irrational theories to justify their foolishness that's basically what I'm talking about here is that they this destroy scripture in order to justify their ignoramus I mean their um, biases Many only know of one translation in their language and base their understanding of scripture on it. And thoughts of divine knowledge giving, uh, given them when ideas pop into their head. So, you know, uh, some people will read scripture from, and, they'll, and an idea will get popped into their head and they think, oh, that was from God or whatever. And they think they have some divine knowledge. Okay. And sometimes that does happen. Okay, you get the uh, divine inspiration from reading scripture, I no doubt about it. But you need to test, test all things to find if it is good before one proclaims it with some confidence. Okay. So testing means it needs to be questioned. And questioning it doesn't mean that you're a heretic. Okay. Questioning means you're trying to actually find out if it's from God or not. Okay. Okay. And, um, uh, there, there was a person who uh, I was reading, uh, Matthew Barrett of the Gospel Coalition. He gives a definition which is good, and I could hold to it for, you know, this infallibility idea. Okay. Uh, the doctrine of the authority and inerrancy of Scripture is that, okay, this is what it is, as a culinary of inspiration of Scripture. Okay, that's fine. God breathed Scripture are wholly true in all things that they assert. Okay, not what you assert, but what they assert. In the original autographs, and therefore function with the authority of God's own words. Okay, so that means that if it's not talking about science, it, you don't use it for science. Okay. If it's not, if, if it's talking, you know, if it's, if it's making a, uh, and, uh, a kind of a archetype of history it's not necessarily talking about history it's talking about a principle of history so yeah you know like um, so or, or you know if it's explaining you know divine beings or whatever it's not talking about um you know, things in, in the manner that you may understand, in a sense, you know, or conceive, you know, um, you know, 
sometimes wings means that things can travel fast or be in all directions or stuff like that. So some things are hard to convey into words and you have to realize that sometimes the Bible has to convey things that are hard to convey into words and understand it in that manner. Uh, some things are easier to convey, but you actually have to study the word and really think about it and question it in order to have some understanding about things and some things are just very, very, very hard to understand. Like, and to go around saying, well, this is the way it is, like let's say for how it's going to happen in the future. Uh, it's being very presumptuous and arrogant and um, that's not really, you know, if you're in the spirit, you're very humbled. You are humbled, not going around arrogant and thinking you know everything. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> in original autographs and therefore function with authority of God's word. So I think this is not a bad definition. I can hold to it because it says that they assert, not that we you assert. Okay. Uh, the reason I agree with this is that they assert instead of what others say they assert. I do not agree in distorting what scripture says, though uh, many do do that and don't even realize it. Distortion is the practice of many Christians. They are usually so unaware of what they are doing when they are doing it, and I find it is something to be pitied. You know, they're not aware of what they're doing. I think that if you're going to say something that's about something, you should be aware that you, it may be your own idea, and to think that uh, it's God's idea is, you have to be very, like you're, you're talking about God's word, and to not have the fear of the Lord, to go around proclaiming you know everything um, in that manner, uh, you are you're going to have to talk to God about that. Like, it's serious stuff. So don't go around being so presumptuous and arrogant about your thinking. Okay. Yeah, so what is asked for Christians to be, what I ask for Christians is to be aware, to be aware of who they are, what they're saying. On understanding, on understanding Scripture, I state, consider this, or this makes sense to me. So what I'm saying is, if you, you can say, okay, I've studied this, as far as I know, this makes sense to me. Question me, find out if I'm right. Uh, but, you know, um, if you're searching for truth, you have to be able to be open to that idea, okay? To not to think that you know and if and if you what you know doesn't survive the questions, it doesn't. It's not truth. It just isn't. So be humble enough to say, "Well, I never thought of that before. I really should uh, check that out. Maybe I don't know what I'm what I thought I knew and what what they proclaimed in the Westminster Confession. Maybe I, I thought it was true, but maybe it's not, or maybe." What I thought about Calvin is, you know, like, I thought that was true, but maybe it's not, you know. Uh, I think you have to be open to, uh, to look and to not think that you know and to really question. Remember, the word Israel is wrestling with God. And you really have to wrestle and really try to find out. And if you don't, can't really find out, then... You have to ask. You have to ask. God bless me, because I really, really don't know. And when he blesses you, he will humble you. He will dislodge your hip. And he will humble you so that uh, you can learn. Okay? So, um, it is something less learned in the very name Israel and what happened to Jacob at the river. So I'm just leaving that with you right now. Um, I pray that you will be humble enough to learn. I try to be humble enough to learn. I certainly don't know everything. Uh, I'm willing to learn more. And 
I like to keep things really simple. Like if you have the confession uh, that you believe in Christ and that he saved you and you're not able and he saved you by his work on the cross and he in his acceptance of you for your forgiveness of sins um, and he is on high to give you that relationship of knowing him and of asking him and being with him and that's good enough for me I don't care what you believe whether the word earth is inverted upside down circle or whatever it doesn't I don't care or that that we're the sun's inside the earth and then we're I don't really care you're still Christian whatever um, so uh, even if you have crazy ideas about other things what I consider crazy anyway I still believe that you're a Christian okay if you believe in Christ's work that saves you you're a Christian Okay, anyway, uh, God bless, and may you, um, and we, you know, and, you know, I started off with talking about nations, and a nation uh, needs to be built on, uh, on a belief of truth, a uh, good nation. I mean, other nations are built on gangsters in well, most nations, but I believe in the rule of law, and the highest law is... Uh, love God love the good love life and be thankful for what God's given you and do what you can to be a servant of others okay? love others and uh, I think that's a nation that is worth living for and it's the kingdom of God that's the foundation of the kingdom of God so uh, and you build it on that you build a nation that is worth living in, let me tell you. Okay. Anyway, uh, God bless, and uh, I'll be talking more about the Westminster Confession and other talks.